Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, for this accurate record of times past and events yet to come, for its precise assessment of the human heart and eternal hope revealed within its pages. Lord, we ask that you open our minds to your teaching, soften our hearts to your direction, and increase our love for you. Amen. This morning we read two prophecies, one against God's people, against Zion, the other against the enemy, Nineveh, the capital of the Syrians. We'll begin with the prophecy against Zion in Joel 2. This prophecy comes probably during the reign of Joash, around the late 9th century BC. It speaks primarily to Judah, but Israel is mentioned in verse 27, so there is relevance to both the northern and southern kingdoms. Let's read Joel 2, starting from verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale, like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall, they march, each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths, they do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path, they burst through the weapons, and are not halted. They leap upon the city, they run upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through, wi through windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? The book of Joel doesn't give us any details about how Judah and Israel transgressed to draw the anger of God, except that according to verse 12, their hearts had turned away from him. In any case, they have broken the covenant which God had made with them through Moses. This takes more than just a few individuals going astray. There were procedures for dealing with that. When people sinned, they would have to repent, make restitution, offer sacrifices. They were supposed to hold each other account to this. This was much more than just a few individuals going astray. The nation as a whole had neglected the promises that they had made to God. And so God was pronouncing judgment. He was preparing to pour out his wrath upon them. That's not a position you want to be in. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. About a hundred years later, Nineveh finds itself in the same position at the receiving end of a warning from God. Let's now read from Nahum 3, starting from verse 1. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, the crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot. Horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end, they stumble over the bodies, and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and deadly of charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. 
And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart to sea, and water her wall? Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. Put and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. For her honoured men, lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has devoured your bars. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mould. There will the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like the locust. Multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increased your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spreads its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes like clouds of locusts settling on the fences in a day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? The sins of Nineveh were grievous. The highest judge pronounced sentence upon the great city and his word is final. They'd had their chance. A hundred years before Nahum, another prophet, a very reluctant prophet, was sent to Nineveh. There was much animosity between Israel and Assyria, so you can imagine that Jonah didn't want to go into enemy territory and risk his life to warn a people he had no love for. But when he finally did go, God had already prepared their hearts and they repented and were spared. Now, a century later, they were back to their old ways. Nineveh, that great city, full of violence, full of vice. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. Their evil had once again come up before the Lord. Now, you might be thinking, but the law was for Israel. When we think of the law, we tend to think of the covenant God made with Israel through Moses, the Ten Commandments, written on stone tablets. But God instituted laws before that which apply to all mankind. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. When Jonah spoke to Nineveh, their consciences were moved and they were cut to the heart because they knew that they were guilty before their creator. But now in time, their hearts had grown cold, their conscience seared, their idolatry drove them deeper into depravity. And all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and deadly of charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. God gave them what their wicked hearts desired and he handed them over to a reprobate mind and if that that wasn't bad enough they ensnared other nations with their idolatry what a difference a hundred years can make thinking about this I look back at the last 50 years of this nation and despair for its future not long after the prophecy of Nahum Nineveh fell Assyria was overrun by the Babylons, Babylonians. Nineveh lived by the sword. Now they would suffer the type of violence that they had inflicted upon others. And no one would mourn their demise. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? In the end, 
God ceased to show mercy for Nineveh. But his mercy for Zion continues. He implored his people, and we're back to Joel, continuing on from verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the minister of, ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? God loves his people. He wants them to return to him. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, rend your hearts and not your garments. God is not looking for an outward display, but a change of heart. For the natural man, sin is desirable, but when we are made alive in Christ, sin becomes abhorrent to us. Now, we still have bodies of flesh, and while the spirit is indeed willing, the flesh is weak. While we, we live in these mortal lives, we will still succumb to temptation. But when we sin, our conscience accuses us. Our heart is torn and we plead forgiveness from our Father in heaven. The people of Zion repented of their transgression and God forgave them. God said, I will have mercy upon whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The Lord had mercy on Zion. And we'll continue on from verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land. He, he had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner, far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain, as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no one else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. This is one of those prophecies which has been partly realised but a complete fulfilment is yet to come. Currently, Israel is a secular nation they reject the Lord because they reject God's Son, Yeshua, who he sent into the world. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. They will someday repent and accept Jesus as the Messiah. In Acts 2, we read about the Holy Spirit filling the apostles at Pentecost. When they preached the mighty works of God, everyone who gathered there heard the message in their own language. Not surprisingly, there was some confusion, so Peter, in explanation, quoted the following passage from Joel, starting at verse 28. 
<clears throat> and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young, young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This pouring out of God's spirit was just the beginning. This prophecy covers the last days, the period of time from Pentecost until Jesus comes again. There are parts of this passage which are yet to be fulfilled. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom, whom the Lord calls. God's kingdom is not just the nation of Israel. Everyone from every nation who calls on the name of the Lord is saved. That salvation was realised by Christ's work on the cross. The message for Zion and the message for, Z for Nineveh was the same. It's the same message for everyone, even now. Judgment is coming. You've been found wanting. You are guilty. The difference is that God has mercy on Zion, but for Nineveh, his patience ran out. But what's the relevance for us? What are these prophecies from more than two and a half thousand years ago telling us. Nineveh is the world. Nineveh was under the influence of Satan, just as the world is today. And judgment came down upon them. Well, there's lots of evil happening now in this world. Why is it taking so long for Jesus to return? Why hasn't judgment day come yet? In the same way that God showed mercy to Nineveh in the time of Jonah, he is now showing mercy to the people of the world. The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is restraining Satan, but this is only a reprieve. Nineveh eventually came under the full influence of the evil one, and as a result, God's wrath was poured out against it. In the same way, we can see the end of this world coming. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Zion, on the other hand, is God's kingdom, his chosen people. It's not just the Jews, it's all of those that he has set aside for salvation. Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Assyria was a mighty empire, but no amount of earthly strength can withstand the Lord of hosts. God defeated Nineveh. Someday, he'll de defeat the powers of the earth. We learn of this in Revelation 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. The one sitting on the horse is Jesus. But imagine that. All the power of the armies of the world gathered together in one place. We know this as the Battle of Armageddon. This, I think, is a misnomer. It's not a phrase that appears in the Bible. All the world's mighty forces will come together there at Armageddon for battle, but it won't be a battle. It will be a rout. There will be no war, only defeat. And the beast was captured, and with it, the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had, dece who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulphur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Don't be in the position of Assyria. 
Don't be so foolish as to be an enemy of the living God. Let go of the seductions of Nineveh. Become a citizen of Zion. You can't sit on the fence. There's no in-between. If you aren't in God's kingdom, you belong to Nineveh, to the world. You are God's enemy. But how can we be citizens of Zion when we live here in Nineveh, in this corrupt world? At the moment, while we are bound to the flesh, we must live in the world. But when Jesus prayed for his disciples, he addressed this. This is his prayer from John 17. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, so that they may also be sanctified in truth. So why must we be in the world? I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Bringing people to repentance is the work of the Holy Spirit, but as believers, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are called to proclaim the good news to all mankind. As Jesus said, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Just as the prophets were sent to rebellious peoples to declare God's truth, we have been sent into this world, not to be part of it, but to proclaim the gospel. We're strangers in a foreign land. We are ambassadors for Christ. So how can you be sure that Zion is your home city? What sets you apart from the people of Nineveh? Don't think that because you come to church on a regular basis that you will be saved. Even amongst the Jews, God's chosen people, the only ones to be saved, are the ones to whom God shows mercy. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Amongst the people in this building and the people watching online and all the people going to churches everywhere and all the people not going to church, the only ones who are saved are those to whom God shows mercy. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. But how can you know that God has shown you mercy and given you this gift of faith? And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We know that we've been chosen by God for salvation because we have called on the name of the Lord. You can't do that unless God has drawn you to himself. But what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Jesus told us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. For a long time now, the church has preached a false gospel, a damnable doctrine that says, all you have to do to go to heaven is repeat a prayer and ask Jesus into your heart. Legions of people have been led to a false assurance. We're now seeing the fruit of this heresy as countless thousands lose a faith that was built on sand. People think that because they said a prayer all those years ago, that because they ticked that box, that makes them okay but it's a false hope that ends in the lake of fire. Some people have said their prayer in vain, but subsequently have been saved when they called upon the name of the Lord, sometimes years or even decades later. So what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? If you are calling upon the Lord for salvation, it means that you realise first that you need saving, that you have sinned against God, to call upon the Lord is an admission of guilt. There's a realisation that you can't make things right. You have incurred a debt that you cannot possibly pay. To call upon the Lord 
is an admission that you cannot save yourself. All you can do is ask God for his mercy. Then, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is only possible because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Just like Nineveh, we all like sheep have gone astray. Judgment has been proclaimed upon us. We deserve the unmitigated fury of our Creator, eternity in the lake of fire. God is perfectly just. No sin goes unpunished. But God poured out His wrath upon His only begotten Son. Jesus laid down His life for our sins. And because He has the power over death, He rose again, which means that we can have confidence that He can give us eternal life. The citizens of Nineveh, this world, they're all destined for destruction. Don't be one of them. Come to Zion, where there is mercy, where there is life. Faith in the things of this world is misplaced. Jesus is our only hope. Turn to Him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are the only living God. All glory and honour and power are yours. No one can stand against you. You are perfectly righteous and just. We thank you that you are also loving and that your love far exceeds our limitations. We thank you for the ultimate expression of this love in the gift of your only Son, that he suffered and died for us, even though we were your enemies. We thank you that he has defeated death so that we also now have victory over death and can look forward to eternity with our loving Heavenly Father. We ask now that you guide us and strengthen us. Give us the wisdom and courage we need to act as your ambassadors in this foreign land. Continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can be salt and light to this dying world. This we pray in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.